Welcome to the New Books Network. I think I had, I don't know who many people have, an inherent interest in the physicality of people, in the, in the setting in which people live, in the purposes, in their flesh and bloodedness, and in making knowledge as, as a kind of work. This is what I experienced in doing science, and I wanted to see if I could, as many other historians have tried to do, to introduce some of these things and telling stories about this famous passage of, of science in the 16th and 17th centuries. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the New Books and Intellectual History channel on the New Books Network. My name is Mark Malloy, and I'm the reviews editor at Make a Literary Magazine. I'm talking today with Dr. Stephen Shapin, Franklin L. Ford Research Professor of the History of Science, Harvard University. Dr. Shapin's previous books have included Leviathan and the Air Pump, Hobbes, Boyle, and the Experimental Life, A Social Truth, A Social History of Truth, Civility and Science in 17th Century England, Science is Culture, The Scientific Life, A Moral History of a Late Modern Vocation, Never Pure, Historical Studies of Science as if it was produced by people with bodies situated in time, space, culture, and society and struggling for credibility and authority, and several edited books. The book we will be discussing today is The Scientific Revolution, a work which aims to engage with and summarize a more or less canonical account of changes in belief widely said to be characteristic of the scientific revolution, while giving some indication that relevant beliefs varied and were even strongly contested. First published by University of Chicago Press in 1996, and recently republished in 2018 with an updated bibliographic essay, The Scientific Revolution has been translated into 16 languages. Welcome, Dr. Shapin, and thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. I was wondering if you could begin by telling us a bit about yourself, both your training and the focus of your work. I think there are two things that might be relevant. One is that I was did graduate work in science and genetics, as it happens, before taking up my my life as an historian of science. And the other is that I went to a small liberal arts college that had a foundational humanities course in which we had a small section on the scientific revolution. I think those two things are relevant. I can tell you briefly why. In terms of my education, I found the section on the scientific revolution the most boring thing that I'd ever encountered. And I I still retain the book, and I won't mention the name of the book that dealt with the subject. But it left me with a desire, as time went on, as an historian of science, to see if I couldn't do something for current students in institutions that had humanities, or as they used to be called, Western Civ courses, to introduce them to passages of the making of of science in the early modern period. And I did. I mean, that book is now used in my liberal arts college's foundational year. So I'm very pleased about that. And I hope the students aren't as bored as I was with my experience. Without naming the book or the author, I'm curious what put you off about it. The subject matter seems to me inherently interesting two things, and the one, the second more than the first, the first thing that put me off was the celebration of progress to modern science and the idea, even before I'd become an historian, I thought the idea that modernity was made by turning on a light switch was rather implausible. Uh, The second thing that put me off is the lack of what I would call context. Ideas were treated sequentially, one idea, the next idea, the relationship between one idea and the other idea. You read the rather long subtitle of my book called Never Pure. And I suppose I always had the instinct that ideas were made by people, people that had purposes, people living in a certain time and place. 
and also people doing things. So there was a lack of materiality as well. And I suppose this really gets me on to the second part of my background is that I was very briefly in, in a lab doing science. I didn't take a PhD, but I did all the coursework for a PhD. And I discovered something that really I had not had that much experience of when I in my first degree, my bachelor's degree, and that was science was hard. It was work. Most experiments didn't succeed. You called for help. You had no idea what you were doing. And then if you finally got results, how to communicate them to other people so they believed what you thought the experiments had shown. And all that was lacking, getting back to the book I read when I was an undergraduate, all that was lacking. So the two things really enforced each other. One, I think I had, and I hope many people have, uh, an inherent interest in in the physicality of people, in the, in the setting in which people live, in the purposes, in their flesh and bloodedness, and in, uh, in making knowledge as, as a kind of work. This is what I experienced in, in doing science, and I wanted to see if I could, as many other historians have tried to do, to introduce some of these things and telling stories about this famous passage of, of science in the 16th and 17th centuries. So I think those two things about my background bore on the, what I tried to do in this little book. And in you know, the, some of the other things that I've written about early modern science, in case listeners aren't sure, early modern is usually something like the middle of the 16th century to the middle of the 18th century. It's a historian's designation, early modern. Those are the things about my background that inform what it was I was trying to do in this little book. You begin your book with Alexander Quare and his celebration of the conceptual changes at the heart of the scientific revolution as, quote, the most profound revolution achieved or suffered by the human mind, end quote. You quote him as an example of a previous time in the history of science, a time of greater confidence, of triumphalism and simplification. To be clear, you spend the entirety of your book making the case for why the reality is more complex, heterogeneous, and nuanced than the, that classic narrative. Still, I am fairly certain that you yourself would concede the years between, say, the birth of Nicholas Copernicus in 1473 and the death of Isaac Newton in 1727 saw an immense transformation in human knowledge and power. Could you begin by painting us a picture of what the proto-scientific intellectual life of a European would have been like in, say, the year 1400? And then could you contrast that with the worldview of a stereotypical product of the scientific revolution, say, Joseph Louis Lagrange? To clarify, the reality is far more complex than this, and we will get to that shortly. But I think it would be helpful to begin by painting a simplified portrait to convey the breadth of the distance that was progressed over that century and a half. And we can then proceed into the complexities and nuances that historians have elucidated over the past few decades. Well, that question is really probing and it's really fundamental to understanding at least what I'm trying to do in the, the book. You say that the book tries to show that the situation was more complex. I want to suggest that it's not just more complex, it's actually different. And a lot of the differences that I'm trying to draw to readers' attention are, are contained in your question. The question, how did we get from example from Copernicus to Newton, is a question that Poiret would completely have recognized. Because it's a question that asks, how do we situate the scientific revolution in the lineage that leads to modern science. And it's a question that situates the lineage as changes in astronomy and specifically in mathematics. And I'm going to say natural philosophy. Listeners can think of the, of the term physics if they like. So the request for stereotypical changes, I think, can see too much to the picture that Quare was painting about how modern science was made. The trouble that I'm trying to make for that story is, I think, a little bit more significant 
than the idea of making things more complex because they don't simply want to make trouble for the Copernicus to Newton uh, model. I want to suggest other, and as you say, fundamental changes that are taking place in this period that are also important for the question about how did we get from there to, to here. Uh, and there are questions that direct attention away from mathematical physics, if you like, and to sciences that are re rarely thought of in terms of making the modern world, but uh, that I'm trying to suggest are really important in, in, in doing so. So that's one issue. The other issue is the question of coherence. So to give an account of what Copernicus believed or what Isaac Newton believed is usually in traditional history of science to ask what aspects of what they believed and what aspects of what they did led up to the present, led up to, to modern science. Now, one thing that historians do that's, I think is interesting, it should be interesting to general readers, but it's sometimes not appreciated by, by many people, is they, they don't ask how did we get the right answer, but what did people believe at a specific time and place? In other words, to characterize the variety of belief, the heterogeneity of belief, and also how much of the old was contained in what we regard as the new. Let me give you two quick examples. One example comes from Copernicus. Copernicus discovered, as we say, the heliocentric system of the universe, but he did, he did not discover Kepler. He did not discover Isaac Newton, and he retained the idea of perfect circular motion, which he inherited from classical antiquity, specifically from Aristotle. Isaac Newton, we celebrate as discovering the universal uh, laws of gravitation, the inverse square law. But what he believed about gravity is, a, is an interesting and disputed matter. Isaac Newton also wrote more words on alchemy and biblical chronology than he did on, on natural philosophy and mathematics. So these are issues that I think should be interesting if the question is, what did they believe at the time, with a subsidiary question, who believed what at the time, and what were they trying to achieve at the time? And th these questions are rather constrained by the question, how did we get from there to, to modern science or some typification of modern science? And I, I mean that not as a dantic off-putting to potential readers, but as I hope as a matter of, this is interesting. This is more interesting than you thought it might be if the question was, how did modern science get discovered? And that's why I, I think the idea of making things more complex somewhat understates what I'm trying to do. But one concession that I want definitely to make to your question, the respect that I have for the question, his book starts with a sense that a lot of people have quoted, and that is, uh, there was no such thing as the scientific revolution. The sentence goes on, and this is a book about it. So it's a hybrid performance. I want to recognize that stories about the scientific revolution are so widely distributed in our culture, are so widely regarded as the passage that made the modern world, that I wanted to pay homage to those stories by dealing in the book with some of the canonical passages and some of the canonical figures, and then making trouble for the linear and simple story uh, about them. So the book is definitely a hybrid performance, if you like, a compromised performance, because I could have written a book about fundamental changes in early modern science in which Isaac Newton doesn't appear. And there will be reasons for doing that. But Isaac Newton does appear, and Robert Boyle does appear, and Descartes does uh, appear. So if I'm making myself clear, I hope, I want to look at, the, at some of the key passages and figures of stories about the scientific revolution making the modern world and use them to try to introduce a more complex, heterogeneous, situated, practical story about what they believed and what they did at the time. And there's one other issue that I think we'll, we may touch on later, and that is could you tell a story about these fundamental changes in early modern science that do have a lineage to the modern world that are to do with practices like medicine, botany, map making, political economy? And I want to suggest you could do that. 
I chose not to do that because I wanted to, to, as it were, extend a hand to people who know the canonical story. Uh, but I think there's still room for a book in which the book is about revolutionary changes in, in science in the period that take not mathematical physics as the center of the story, uh, but botany. And we can talk about that later if you like. Your book, to some degree, moves away from the mathematical physics and towards what could be called a British empiricism. My perception of the scientific revolution is definitely largely colored by the mathematical physics component. So I found that to be an informative aspect of the book. Quare didn't think that the doing of experiments, much less the empirical interrogation, much less uh, fact-making, was very important to his classical story about the scientific revolution. So to move experiment and fact-making to the center of the story, as you say, is already uh, a bit of a change. That seems extraordinary to me. I do feel like even the canonical understanding of the scientific revolution has to do with the development of the scientific method, which is you make a hypothesis, you predict the outcome of an experiment, and then you conduct an experiment to confirm if the result corresponds with your prediction. It's incredible that he, and I suppose a generation of historians, would write that story out of their history. Well, Mark, if I may say, um, the, one of the problems that the book deals with, and that I'm certainly encouraging people to think about, is the idea of the scientific method. There is no stable thing uh, called the scientific method is present, and there were various candidates from what, what it was to produce reliable and powerful and coherent knowledge in the 17th century. Uh, your version, your version is a boil that a version that that uh, Robert Boyle would have recognized. It's not a version that Thomas Hobbes or Descartes would have recognized. And so, that even the idea of the scientific method not only was heterogeneous in the 17th century, but has different legacies to the present and different cultural cultural locations. I think you've mentioned that this uh, this is a story that the British are most familiar with. I could say the Dutch as well. It's not a story that the French are comfortable with. So the hero of the scientific revolution in many British accounts is Robert Boyle and a version of Isaac Newton. The French, the story is about Descartes. So we, we live in a more heterogeneous modern scientific world and there are different lineages to the past that different cultures have constructed that lead back to conceptions of method, as you say. But method is no one stable thing called the scientific method. Although I entirely agree with you that the extent to which Quare, by the way, a, uh, a Russian emigre to France and very much writing in French, recognized was the lineage that leads back to deductive methods, mathematics, and the coherence and logical relationship between concepts and not the doing of experiments, or certainly not experiments in the way that, that Francis Bacon or Robert Boyle did them. So if you're studying the history of science in France and you're, you're studying the history of science in Anglo-American cultures, you're actually studying some rather different things. I was wondering if we could next turn to the question of the influences that brought about the scientific revolution. As noted, the scientific revolution is a nebulous concept with no hard borders. So you can push this as far back as you like. A quick skim of your book surfaces a few influences. The fact that traditional stocks of knowledge had been shown lacking. The new worlds that were opened up by the voyages of exploration and the telescope and microscope. The Renaissance humanist rediscovery of ancient secular Greek texts, including mathematical texts. Advances in mathematics, especially algebra. Frustration with scholastic disputatiousness. The emergence of courts, in addition to the church, as a source of funding, etc. This is just a sampling. Your book covers so much more. Can you quickly talk us through what you see as the salient circumstances that led to the scientific revolution? Again, the issue of the stability and coherence of the idea of the scientific revolution is very much an issue in this sorts of things, because 
because if you want to talk about conditions, still less causes uh, for changes, you're going to uh, have to ask the question about changes in what? So stories that, that bear strongly on mathematical physics and natural philosophy are not necessarily the stories that bear strongly on chemistry uh, and, and botany. That said, this, the, the, the request for stories about what prompts these changes, where these is, is it, if I may say, much more various than traditional accounts allowed is, is a really interesting and important one. And it's rather gone by the way in a lot of modern academic history of science, the, the, the tradition in which these uh, causal stories was most well-developed is also very unfashionable in uh, modern academia, and that's Marxism. Uh, the Marxists were very keen on telling causal stories about the rise of modernity and even about the rise of modern science, because this was a story, as the Marxists told it, about the fundamental role of changes in technology and in and in uh, production, and especially in the technology uh, of producing. So it was a story that, that Marxists liked to tell and did tell, especially from the 1930s through about the 1950s, really up until the end of the Cold War. Now, Marxism is going seriously out of fashion, but they did foreground causal stories about changes in ideas, which was a very radical thing to do and um, infuriated a lot of Western liberal thinkers. So one part of the story that I think really should be retained in the Marxist story is what was going on in the economy, what was going on in production with natural knowledge always deemed to be relevant to production and, and improvements in production, the more so when machines are involved. So if you tend to identify in part or strongly the scientific revolution with the rise of mechanical explanations of the natural world, then the presence and role of machines in early modern society is going to be very important. And the Marxists did, did tell that story. So in other words, clocks are very important. Pumps are very important. Balances are very important. Can you model the understanding of nature on clocks, pumps, uh, and balances? Very interesting set uh, of questions. So that's one thing that I want to, to throw into the mix. The other things that you've suggested uh, and, uh, include uh, changes in the boundaries of participation in culture and specifically in scientific culture. Print, the invention of movable type printing, the extension of print and therefore the extension of learning beyond the boundaries that it had in the medieval uh, period. So print associated with social changes, uh, extending the boundary of literacy, including a, a group of people that Marxists laid great emphasis on, literate artisans, people actually involved, as Isaac Newton was not, as Descartes was not, in producing things with machines. The extent to which these people became literate and could have access to classical knowledge and produce their own books recording their own empirical experience is fundamentally important. This is related to the Protestant Reformation. And that is one of the key gestures of the Protestant Reformation is the authorities of the church say this about the Bible, you read the Bible for yourself. You come to your own opinion empirically, if you like, in your engagement with Holy Scripture. The fundamental gesture of Protestant Protestantism presupposing that Bibles were available to be read by people who, in and also in what we call the vulgar languages, not just in Latin and Greek, but in English and Flemish and Italian and so on. Again, extending the boundaries of participation, but also telling people that their engagement with a book, the holy book, was pertinent to discerning uh, truth. And there's a series of, uh, of other issues. Now, one moves away from mathematical physics as the center of the story to things that I've suggested, like cartography, like political economy, like botany, like medicine. Many of these items remain on the list of relevant causes that go into the mix, but voyages of discovery assume a much greater emphasis here. Europeans are, are encountering the new rapidly. The unexpected new, new plants, 
uh, new minerals, new new people, new uh, religions, new new belief systems as these voyages uh, of discovery to the east and the west proceed. And this continues through the 18th and uh, 19th century. Also, the embeddedness in these voyages of discovery of technologies that require scientific knowledge, new scientific knowledge, more exact scientific knowledge, navigation, open sea navigation, is a tremendously important spur the development of astronomy and mathematical astronomy, map making, star chart making, lunar theory making. You needed these things for effective open sea navigation. So not only did these voyages bring back new things from the newly discovered lands, in order to, to explore over these distances, you actually needed not just new technology for navigation, for finding your way about, but new scientific knowledge to make those new tools. And then you needed ways of describing the distant world. So map making, not just on land, but also on the, the open sea. But how did you tell people about the plots that you had discovered in the East Indies? How did you make pictures of them? How, if at all, could you bring them back? How could you describe, how could you acquire knowledge of what the powers of these plants were especially the medicinal powers. Uh, all of these things are, are, are relevant to telling a story about the fundamental changes in knowledge that took place. Uh, and, and there are more, because as we, as we de develop a more heterogeneous view of what these fundamental changes were, more and more circumstances, conditions, and causes become relevant. I think we've touched on some of the main ones, uh, but there are more. Your book is not an exhaustive catalog of individuals or particular experiments, focusing more on a high-level conceptual discussion. This is to its credit. It explains how you managed to cover such a huge swath of material so concisely. But you do in places zero in on specific episodes to illustrate points or convey the world. For example, you write on multiple occasions about the work of Torricelli and Pascal, and separately, the work Boyle did with the air pump, which you describe as, quote, the scientific revolution's greatest fact-making machine, end quote. Could you talk us through either the work that Torricelli did and then the work of confirmation that Pascal did later, or the work that Boyle did with the air pump to illustrate but one example of what scientific discovery or knowledge making looked like at the time? Yes, uh, let me be very brief about Torricelli and Pascal. And for the listeners, I want just to briefly describe these, these classic experiments. And I'm going to spend more time because I think what Boyle was doing is really rather different. Uh, and uh, I also want to point out that it is Boyle or Boyle and his technicians that invented the air pump. This is an invention, 1658, 1659, uh, that were not available to Torricelli and Pascal. Torricelli, as we now say, invents the barometer. And what he does is he takes a glass cylinder about 30 inches long, fills it up with mercury, sticks his thumb over the open part of the, of the tube, inverts it into a dish containing more mercury. And what he sees is the column of the mercury descends. So the full tube of mercury uh, now has a space above it. And the height of the mercury in the tube standing up above the level of mercury in the dish is about 29 inches. That's Torricelli. And as we now say, if we have our barometric readings, it's um, uh, the barometer reading is 30.06 or 29.54. That's the barometer is basically the Torricellian experiment. Now, what does Torricelli think he's done? What he's done is one experiment. It's a classic experiment. He wants to uh, address the question, a uh, classic question about whether a vacuum exists. Okay. And he wants to answer the question about if a vacuum exists, why is it to that extent? Remember at the top of the tube, he's got about an inch. There's nothing there. Question, is that nothing a vacuum? So he's engaging with a question that was known to Aristotle, 
that the Aristotelians that are around at his time have a big investment in. And the investment is there cannot be, of the Aristotelians, there cannot be a vacuum. And the reason is nature abhors a vacuum. So wherever a vacuum threatens to exist, matter will rush in to fill it to prevent a vacuum from existing. The world is a plenum. That's to say it's full of stuff. There is no vacuum. And the reason that there is no vacuum is because nature abhors a vacuum. This is a classical problem. And one experiment Torricelli is dealing with addresses that question. No, it doesn't uh, address the question about abhorrence because the response from an Aristotelian is, yes, there can be no atmospheric air at the top of this tube. All you have established, Torricelli, is that nature's abhorrence of a vacuum is limited. That's the extent to which nature abhors a vacuum. The same reason why you cannot pump water up beyond about 30 feet. Now, Pascal is also interested in a matter of principle. Pascal is interested, uh, can you model the understanding uh, of, uh, of the atmosphere on, the, on a, a, a balance, a, a balance scales? And he approaches it by doing an experiment. And the experiment involves climbing a mountain. So take Torricelli's experiment, and Pascal got his brother-in-law to do it, so he didn't have to climb the mountain for himself. We will keep one of these Torricelli experiments, a barometer at the bottom of, of a mountain, and you, my brother-in-law, will take the Torricelli experiment up to the top of the mountain, and we will see what happens. And what happens is the level of the uh, mercury in the experiment that's taken up the mountain becomes lower and lower. He's recording the height of the mercury at the bottom of the mountain. So we now have a recording of a lower level of the mercury in the tube at the top of the mountain. And Pascal's conclusion is the weight of the atmosphere is less at the top of the mountain. The ocean of the air is less at the top of the mountain than it is at the bottom. So that what we are measuring in the, in the Pascal experiment is the experimentally establishing the weight of the atmosphere in the same way that you would use weights on a balance to establish the weight of a tested object. Now, what I want to say about these two things is they're relevant to the question of a vacuum. They're relevant to the questions of the nature of matter. They're relative to the question about whether a mechanical explanation of the natural world is possible, but they are single experiments, classic experiments, what Robert Boyle is doing in the air pump is something entirely different, I want to suggest. And that is he has created, as he pumps the air out of the glass receiver and air pump, he is performing essentially Pascal's experiment and creating a space within the glass receiver in which he can do all sorts of experiments. Is sound propagated? Do birds die? Does a candle go out? And finally, if you put the torus shelling experiment in the air pump, tricky thing to do, and then pump the air out, will you see in the decreasing level of the atmosphere what Pascal's brother-in-law saw as he took the Torricellian barometer up to the top of the Puy de Dome mountain in France? So what he has created, as it were, is an experimental world within the air pump in which he is going to do masses of experiments, not one, but use it as a space in which masses of experiments can be done. And the final thing uh, I want just now to suggest about what Boyle does in the air pump is he doesn't really want to do what could be called metaphysics. Let's take the issue of the vacuum. As he pumps the air out of the receiver in the air pump, is he creating a vacuum? In other words, this contested thing in classical natural philosophy, is it possible to have a space in which nothing exists? What Boyle says is very English, very modest, very provisional. He says, I'm not going to address the question of a vacuum. What I'm going to say is I've created a space in which there is no or almost no atmospheric air. So he wants to, as it were, create a, 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 a lower temperature. He wants to create a a gap between 
the doing of experimental science and metaphysics and these sorts of questions uh, about vacuums, about abhorrence, and about mechanism and principle. And he wants to address it in its complexity uh, as doing a whole series uh, of experiments. And the, the point about an air puppet experiment is it is creating the world as we like on the dimensions of a tabletop that you can assemble people around, perform a range of experiments, have them witnessed, and then reported in circumstantial detail. So when you describe the idea of the, the experimental, the scientific method as a series of framing hypotheses and doing masses of experiments and seeing what is supported and what is not supported, this is very close to what Robert Boyle is trying to do. But I think although it addresses questions about uh, mechanism about the weight of the atmosphere and about vacuum, I think Boyle is trying to introduce a different game to be played, if I can say so, than Torricelli and, and Pascal are attempting to do. And I hope that's a, a kind of a quick summary of what these three are doing, because they are related. In other words, Boyle is doing what he regards as, uh, he says, the chief experiment. He puts the barometer in the air pump and pumps out the air. So it establishes an intellectual lineage between Tard Shelley and Pascal and Robert Boyle. But I think what he's doing is such a fundamentally different set of practices that they deserve that sort of respect and attention in their own right. One of the most intriguing insights from your book is your explication of the religious motivations for the scientific inquiry. This to me is a classic example of something that at first seems counterintuitive, but then when you are walked through the logic of it, it makes perfect sense. Briefly, some of the religious motivations for scientific inquiry could include purging heretical Renaissance naturalism, which was the thought that attributed sentience to nature itself, purging extraneous details and pagan influences from the Bible, that were thought to have been added by copyists and commentators. The notion that the book of nature was written by God, and so to study the book of nature was to study the word of God. All of these and other factors led to significant religious support for the scientific revolution. Could you talk to us a bit about this, as well as the countervailing tendencies that saw the new science as a threat to the established Aristotelian theology? Uh, yes. I mean, I mean, I think what I want to do is to engage, I hope respectfully, with the sensibilities that, that are surprised, if not shocked, by stories that uh, establish the compatibility of science with religion, or even the, the positive supportive relationship between science and religion in the earlier modern period. Because these stories have a, themselves an interesting historical origin. They were told in the Victorian period. They're told from the middle to the end of the 19th century, books called The Conflict of Science and Religion, The Warfare Between Science uh, and Religion. They were told for specific purposes that obtained in the middle to later part of the 19th century. Those books are still in print. And for those who have problems with the teaching of Darwin in the schools or with creationism uh, or with uh, fundamentalism, those stories continue to be very attractive and very powerful. See? One of the problems of, um, for scientific authority is religious sensibilities. And some of these stories that were told in the 19th century are stories about the scientific revolution and about the conflict between science uh, and religious concerns at the time. Now, as close as stories can come to saying something like this, those stories, as stories about the relations between science and religion in the early modern period, are wrong. That's not something that historians say uh, lightly, but there was no conflict between the category of science, even the category of natural philosophy and Christian religious sensibilities. True, both science and religion were heterogeneous at the time, and we want to understand it, but the more important thing to understand is how it was that changes in science and even bids for authority for for new science proceeded through showing their compatibility or even their support for cherished articles of Christian faith and Christian 
conflict. Those stories have been told uh, in academic history, at least since the 1930s, but they're still not widely known. You mentioned the Book of Nature, and perhaps one of the key notions that helps us understand the supportive relation between science and religion is through the Book of Nature. And as you said, the belief, widely accepted belief at the time, was that God wrote two books. One is the book of uh, Holy Scripture, divinely authored, and especially in, in the Protestant uh, world, that everyone could now read for themselves. Uh, but God had written another book that had equal authority, that contained equal truth about articles of Christian faith, equal evidence of God's existence, and, and attributes and power, and this was the book of nature, and they meant this literally. In other words, that if you could read the book of nature, in other words, if you could expect nature with the God-given faculties, the God-given faculties of your reason, your observation, and your wit, you would come to the same or more indubitable Christian truths as you would from reading scripture. So you have to understand as nature as a code that could be decoded, and here's an important point, either by an ordinary Christian or by those who are as expert in reading the book of nature as the church was in reading the book of scripture. Now, this is an argument very powerful in terms of the Catholic church that had institutionalized expertise in Bible interpreting. Galileo makes this argument, and of course, as we know, gets in trouble with the church by suggesting an argument uh, that there are people who are skilled in reading the book of nature with which there can be no conflict with the Bible. And the people who are skilled at decoding and reading the book of nature are people like him, skilled natural philosophers and astronomers. For if you read the book of nature in a skilled and informed way, which he knows how to do, there can be no conflict between scripture and the evidence of nature. So that notion of the book of nature, and Galileo goes and say, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, and it contains circles and triangles and squares. So those that interpret nature geometrically, if you like geometrically shaped bits of nature moving in mathematical patterns that can be mathematically described, can produce Christian truth equal to or even more indubitable than the book of the Bible. If you look at the interpretation of the Bible, you see the wars of religion. And Galileo is appealing to the idea that competently and skilled interpretation of the book of nature can produce more consensus than Bible reading ever has. This is a dangerous argument, but one he wants to make for the, both the potential contribution that, that science can make to the establishment of religious truths and answering the question, who can do it best? And the answer is not priests. The answer is people like Galileo. So that's one sort of answer that you've, you've uh, when you raise the question of the book of, uh, of nature. Now, I think there are two other things, uh, and that concerns motivation. Uh, because if you look at people like Robert Boyle and Isaac Newton, you see people who are, by every evidence that we have, profoundly religious. The very idea that Robert Boyle and Isaac Newton would be, would be attempting to do anything but supporting a rational, purified, and true Christian religion is untenable. These are, are people who, whose highest aim is to produce a, an imitation of God's knowledge to understand God's working in the world, both God's working in the world and creating the laws of nature and sustaining the laws of nature and then providentially uh, altering the behavior of natural bodies because both believe in miracles. It relates to some of the most esoteric bits of Isaac Newton's philosophy, including the idea of how gravity works uh, and the idea of what powers belong to matter and what powers do not belong to matter. So those are issues that, that can also be discussed. But then you raise the question of how did religion deal with the, uh, I don't misquote you, from, with the uh, threats that were seen to, to come from science 
And I would say for the most part, they do not see threats as coming from science. Uh, there are thinkers whose thought disturbs many parts of the religious establishments at the time. Uh, Thomas Hobbes thought uh, disturbs religious thinkers. Many aspects of Descartes' thought disturb some religious thinkers. And there is a threat from many of these uh, new philosophies, not to religion, but to the institution of what's called scholasticism. In other words, that form of Aristotle's classical thought, which is institutionalized in the universities, in which the professors have a, a deep and profound investment. Because if Robert Boyle, if Descartes, uh, if Isaac Newton are right, then Aristotle is not going to be taught. And in the universities, with many, if not all, of the professors in holy orders, that is a threat. But to say it's a threat to Christianity is, I think, importantly wrong. It is a threat to some of the institutions that speak in the name of Christianity, and especially the universities. And one could talk about why Thomas Hobbes is seen as a threat, and uh, Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, not so much, if at all. But I wanted just to signal that the... The, the question about a threat to Christianity can almost be dismissed. Figures that come to mind, and this may be a simplification, are Copernicus, I think only published at the end of his life. Galileo was put under house arrest. Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake. Burned, yes. All of these lived, uh, I believe, in the, in the South, if that's correct. So that was more... Catholic than Protestant. So you feel this comes as much or more from institutional concerns around protecting Aristotelianism and less from perceived fundamental threats to Christian truth? Now, the, que the question is, is, is a pertinent one. Um, and again, uh, I hope I should sufficiently respect the legitimacy of the question. As indeed, when these Victorian books were published about the warfare between science and religion, if you like, the centerpiece of those stories very often is the trial of Galileo by the church. Even still? Even, absolutely, even still. The stories about Galileo get told and told. You go on the internet, and um, Galileo's trial is alive and well. And for all the work that academic historians are trying to understand the subtleties and the points at issue in Galileo's Trial. And indeed, the difference between Catholicism and um, uh, Protestantism um, uh, are, are alive and well. Uh, and I can't show proper respect for those stories quickly. But the first thing uh, is um, what was Copernicus trying to achieve? Copernicus is, is trying to produce a better predictive astronomy, as in calendar reform. Copernicus has. I'm going to say nothing, and that may have to be slightly edited for, for scholars. Copernicus says nothing to say about the physical arrangements of what we call the solar system. And this was true, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that this was true also with Ptolemy. They weren't necessarily speculating about the underlying reality. They were trying to develop models that could be used to make predictions. And they did not necessarily feel that those models corresponded with the behavior of objects in the actual world, in the celestial sphere. Yes and no. The, I would say the fundamental goal in modeling uh, the solar system was prediction and was the making of calendars, the prediction of solar events. What celestial configuration is going to appear where and when. However, in classical times, they did model uh, the movements of planets, notably on uh, crystalline spheres. Each planet moved by revolving orbs of crystal uh, around the Earth and moving in certain defined ways, creating physical problems for the interpenetration of one crystalline sphere through another. We'll not get into the details of this, if you don't mind. But the fundamental goal of classical astronomy was prediction and not providing a physical model for the, the movements of the heavenly bodies. 
Now you could say, and it's a distinction which is terribly important in the early modern report and terribly important for understanding Isaac Newton's work, is there are two disciplines involved. One is the discipline called mathematics. Now mathematics, which does include what we call abstract or speculative mathematics, but also includes practical mathematics, including things like ballistics, hydraulics, statics, aerostatics. Mathematics is about prediction sufficiently to understand the behavior of natural bodies and to understand and enable the construction of instruments, but does not depend on a physical understanding of those natural bodies. Natural philosophy is another discipline. And natural philosophy asks questions like, what is stuff made up in the world? And what are the real physical causes of things and occurrences in the world? Now, when it comes to Galileo, the church has a problem. And the problem concerns the relationship between these two disciplines. And basically, the church, which tries to be friendly to Galileo, because it is friendly to astronomy and needs to be friendly to astronomy, is, would you please tell us a story about the, the superiority of Copernicus' system for calendar reform and prediction? But would you please, Galileo, not tell a story about the Earth really being at the center of the system? Because the one is to say Copernicus and Galileo are doing mathematics. The other is to say that Copernicus and Galileo are doing natural philosophy and to telling a story, not that Copernicus' system allows us to predict better, if it does, but to say that the earth really is at the center of the system. That is the trouble. And it's not a trouble for one understanding of um, Copernicus achievement, but it is a problem for the other. So these are the grounds in which Galileo gets himself in trouble because he will not stop telling stories about the natural philosophy of the Copernican system. In other words, he really wants to tell a story about the Earth being at the center of the universe and that explaining a range of terrestrial as well as celestial phenomena. This is a particular problem that the church has, and it's not a problem, if I may just say uh, uh, as a side remark, it is not better for the earth to be at the center of things, because there are classical Christian beliefs about earth being at the center of things, which make it a very bad place to be. You only have to think of the center as being the bottom of a cone. So at the bottom of a cone is a place where there is corruption, where there is change, uh, where things die and pass away, as opposed to the heavens where things were immutable and perfect. So the earth being at the center is one thing if you think of it as a, on a plane, and another thing if you think of the earth being at the center as at the bottom of a, of a cone. So there are available ways of thinking of a... Of a, a uh, a geocentric system that don't make it great as a place to be and that were compatible with classical Christian views. I suppose one also say the Galileo, Galileo trial becomes iconic for stories about the incompatibility, but it, it need not be. There are plenty of, uh, of stories, uh, both of troubles between aspects of Christianity and aspects of, of the new science, and plenty of stories about the compatibility aspects of the new science and Christianity to be told. Galileo trial story becomes, as it were, the story. So there are more complex stories to be told about it, but it need not be the story. And the, I also give you the example of Thomas Hobbes. Now, Thomas Hobbes, the Christian church, really hated, really hated. Whether Hobbes was a scientist, is something that could be debated separately, but they hated his mechanism, they hated his materialism, and that mechanism and materialism were embedded in anti-clericalism, a profound and deep dislike of the church, which the church could not fail uh, to notice. Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, Descartes, Galileo were not anti-clerical in this way, Hobbes was. So the church hated Thomas Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes hated the church, and that is different. 
One very illuminating distinction you make concerns the question of what kind of experiential knowledge was sought, how it was to be reliably attained, and how one ought to infer from experience to generalizations or to laws about the natural order. In other words, the practitioners of the new science were in agreement that they wanted to expand their sphere of knowledge, but they disagreed as to how to do so. In an attempted summary, and please correct me if I get this wrong, there were two general schools of thought. First, the school of Descartes and Newton, which prioritized thought experiments and mathematical certainty. This is essentially a, a deductive approach, I believe, to the problem. And on the other hand, you have what can be called the British school, typified by Francis Bacon, which sought probabilistic causal knowledge. This can, I believe, be described as an inductive approach. Can you talk to us briefly about this? Yes, I think that this is very important, although um, some of the relationships that obtain are a bit more complicated than that. I think there's a lot, a lot to be said about the difference between what you call essentially deductive and, and in inductive approaches. But let me uh, respond to your question about where certainty lives in these scientific practices. There's something that Robert Boyle, his mechanical explanation of the world, actually shares with Descartes. Now, Robert Boyle is doing lots and lots of experiments, producing lots and lots of facts, and Descartes essentially is not if I can simplify. But I think they share some sensibility about where certainty lies. And it's something like this. Descartes has a metaphor, uh, which Robert Boyle finds uh, quite congenial, and a lot, lots of people. It's a metaphor, metaphor of the clock. And sometimes uh, they have in mind a specific clock, which is the great clock in the Strasbourg Cathedral in Al Alsace. And they're using the clock, as it were, as a metaphor for nature, which is a very interesting thing in terms of mechanical explanations in general. And they both say, uh, what can one ask, what can be certain? One can be certain about the movement of the hands on the face uh, of the clock. And if you go to the Strasbourg Cathedral, that clock is actually models the movements of the solar system too. So one can be certain about the positioning and the movement of the re relationship in place of celestial uh, bodies, but if you ask the question about what is the cause of them, in other words, open up the clock face and tell me the cause of them, that knowledge is going to be different between machines that human beings make and the machine that God makes, in other words, nature. So in the case of a clock, we can know that the certainty we have about telling the time is brought about by these mechanisms that we see when we open up the face of the clock and see its gears and wheels and springs. But we can't do that with God's nature. In other words, we can't have the certainty and quality of knowledge of causes, of what causes bring phenomena about in God's nature. So about those causes in God's nature, we can have at best probable knowledge. And that is the basis of this notion of probabilism. So certainty for people like Robert Boyle is certainty about phenomena, especially experimentally produced and reliably witnessed and reliably communicated facts about natural phenomena. We can and we should infer from those phenomena, probable causes. And we have, we have assurance that the probable cause of natural phenomena is mechanical in nature, but we can't know that. So we can't have certainty about causes. Now there were, of course, in Descartes, in different moods was one of them, but there were thinkers and especially continental thinkers and uh, including Thomas Hobbes, who didn't think that this was a very powerful source of certain knowledge, to be certain about facts and to wave your hands and to give up the quest for certainty about the causal structure of the world. So you do have a divide 
between deductive tendencies, what is settled, what counts as a rational cause, as a plausible cause, what counts as a reliable no notion of the nature of matter and how matter behaves, and infer from that the behavior of natural phenomena. That is the deductive approach. First get your causes right, first get your definitions right, and then proceed to the various phenomena and appearances of nature. That's deduction. In other moods, Descartes liked that sort of thing, and the continental tradition liked that sort of thing. The English did not. The English were happy that they could have adequate assurance of causal knowledge, but that knowledge could not be as certain as, if you like, mathematics, and it, it could not be as certain as witnessed and reliably performed facts. So you get a cultural different, differentiation. Uh, you asked the question about the kind of experiential knowledge that was sought. And the answer again is it differs. And it also draws in the question is how happy can you be as a scientific practitioner with that quality of knowledge? And the answer is not given by the simple quality of knowledge. The answer is given by a, a sense uh, of what is adequate for human beings uh, situated in this place and in, in time and how confident we ought to be with our quality of knowledge. Another revelatory section is your coverage of the conflict between the scientific revolutions, distrust of authority, and emphasis on direct individual experience. In other words, trusting what your own senses show you, and the necessity of communicating knowledge. After all, not everyone can perform every experiment. Can you talk us through the ways in which theorists and practitioners during the scientific revolution sought to impose quality control over experience reports due to the necessity of secondhand knowledge? Yeah, this, uh, it, it is a matter of vital importance if you're going to say um, that a properly founded scientific knowledge relies upon testimony to exercise some kind of quality control that testimony. However, when you or attempt to exercise that quality control, you're not talking about the world of mathematical proof. You're talking about things which are very human. They include questions, who to believe? What kinds of stories to believe? How to gaze a sincere teller uh, of stories? Uh, what kinds of forms give adequate assurance that phenomena have been directly witnessed and honestly related. So there's no, as it were, royal road to these sorts of, of techniques. And as you say, importantly, when you have this impulse to, uh, as the Royal Society's motto is, nullius in verba, on no one's word, it has been read as only believe things that you see for yourself. Don't believe in authority. And again, as you rightly point out, if you only believe things that you see for yourself, you will believe very little. You won't believe things about the distant past. You won't believe things about the, the distant space. Uh, you won't believe things uh, about uh, unique events that you have not been around to witness. So this is a, a revolution insofar as it can take place in communicating uh, natural phenomena uh, and natural things in a way that gives adequate assurance that they were reliably witnessed. In other words, this is a revolution in the techniques of communication and also revolution in, take, in the techniques of participation and a revolution in the techniques of evaluating claims in a, in a collective communal setting like a, a scientific society. So they involve a range of, of responses one is, uh, not the only one, give us circumstantial detail. So don't simply tell us that a certain thing was seen. Give us the circumstances. What did it look like? In what sort of setting was it seen? What were the other aspects of the scene in which the thing was witnessed? It also involves telling a story in a way that gives the impression that you are reliably communicating, not a fantasist, not seeking uh, self-aggrandizement, not keeping secrets. So 
as opposed to the relations of a magician or an alchemist. Tell us how the things were really done. Give us the names of things that correspond to things that we ourselves have access to. Also, if an experiment is done, tell us who was there when the experiments were done. If necessary, provide us with testimonials of, of the people that were there and witnessed the things. So air pump experiments, not everyone has an air pump. You can't take an air pump off the shelf. Time and time again, in Robert Boyle's experimental writings, he tells you who was there. In the foundation of the Royal Society in 1660, the air pump was brought to the Royal Society to show the assembled fellows of the Royal Society the phenomena. They weren't done in a private alchemist's uh, laboratory. They were done in a carefully defined public of honest and competent observers. So the techniques of performing experiments to a degree in public, the techniques of communicating experimental knowledge so that you could have adequate assurance that things were done. In my jargon phrase, I call this virtual witnessing. You're not seeing the experiments, but you're, you're reading an account of the experiments that provide you as much detail of the scene, if you like, as a, a Dutch still life painting gives you about a glass of wine and a lemon. These things have in common a way of representing unique things in a way that you could feel more realistic. These things are vitally important for really substantial changes in communicating factual knowledge so that a community bigger than the one that was actually there uh, could come to believe that the things were done and done the way described. Dr. Shapin, thank you so much. We've already taken up a great deal of your time. To wrap up, could I just ask you, is there anything you are working on now that you would be willing to share with us? Several things. One is uh, some years ago, I wrote a book about modern sciences, specifically about industrial science, more specifically about entrepreneurial science. I thought, how would it look to tell the story about this unique passage of commercialized entrepreneurial thing making cash motivated science? What would that story look like as told by someone like me who told the story about the religiously motivated utilitarian less sciences of the past? And I tried to do that and I won't, I won't bore your listeners with what that looks like, but I tried to show as with the scientific revolution, aspects of continuity together with fundamental changes. And the other thing I've been working on for some time is what might be called subjectivity. And again, not to use fancy terminology, but you could say that much of the story about 17th century science and the scientific revolution is about the making of objective knowledge, how things really are in the world as opposed to how we feel them to be or how we want them to be. Uh, what would it be if someone like me told the story about designing the flavoring for a hamburger or, or soft drink or describing the tastes and smells of, of wine. Are these things completely arbitrary or the things like that, can they secure a kind of consensus uh, that makes them bear some sort of resemblance to the making of physical or mathematical knowledge? My brief answer is yes, they have some sort of relationship. So subjective knowledge is not completely arbitrary. Uh, it achieves a kind of consensus in a way that much seemingly objective knowledge achieves a kind of consensus. Uh, what does it look like when we describe the consensus that's produced in wine tasting or um, advertising and marketing or politician marketing? So in other words, I'm doing things that are either completely different, but I think they fall out of the earlier work that I did. At least that's how I try to think of them. Before we wrap up, I will just note as an aside to the listener, if you have an old copy of this book from the original 1996 printing, you may want to pick up the 2018 reprint for its bibliographic essay alone. It is a 65-page tour de force guide to many of the major works published on a wide variety of subjects germane to the scientific revolution. From the great tradition to new sources, historiographical revisions and debates, various scientific and mathematical disciplines, key figures, etc. 
Each section includes an overview of recent developments in the field, in addition to the key work cited and described. It seems to me that this section would be as valuable for the lay reader as it is for the specialist. I know that I, by no means a specialist, am already plotting future avenues for exploration with the help of this section. Dr. Shapin, your book is a wonderful introduction to this important and fascinating subject, and I highly recommend it to all our listeners. Thank you so much for writing it and for your time and insights today. It has been such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, too. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I've been speaking with Dr. Stephen Shapin about his book, The Scientific Revolution. It's a wonderful book. If you are interested in the subject matter, whether an expert or a lay reader, I highly recommend it. The theme music for this episode, and for all my episodes, is composed and performed by Dan Lurch. I'm Mark Malloy, and you've been listening to the New Books and Intellectual History channel of the New Books Network. See you next time.